Yu Suzuki is a video game creator that joined Sega in 1983. During his tenure at Sega, he created some of the greatest arcade games ever made. The list of games he developed at the time was the stuff of legends. Having had a hand in directing, designing, producing, and even programming many titles like Hang On, Space Harrier, Outrun, and even Afterburner. These games were fast and graphically visually impressive, but the arcade cabinets themselves had a look and style to them that attracted anyone that would walk by. A common visual feature that you would find in his arcade games was the use of sprite scaling. Sprite scaling is when you take a digital image and rescale it dynamically on the screen. This effect in practice can give off the impression that an object is very far away or very close. And through the use of Suzuki's game designs, it always made it feel like you were playing something that was in 3D. Suzuki's game designs typically featured very fast frame rates, so not only were you getting sprite scaling, but you were also getting incredibly fast responsive gameplay controls. This gave the overall impression that many of Sega's arcade games from the time period were faster than their competitors, and that philosophy of making fun games with a fast frame rate would continue well into the use of 3D polygonal graphics. There are multiple examples of other companies attempting to make 3D games utilizing a 3D engine but when it came to Yu Suzuki, he just figured out how to make it work better. With his introduction of virtual racing, he set the standard for what 3D racing games would feel like from that point forward. Not only was the game visually rich due to its use of 3D polygon graphics, but it also had a very fast frame rate which had quickly become an iconic staple of Yu Suzuki. And just a year later after successfully mastering 3D graphics, he would release the very first 3D fighting game, Virtua Fighter. This was a landmark title as it had to introduce the ideas and philosophies for how a fighting game would work in a 3D space. At this point, it would be impossible to ignore how much of an impact Suzuki had on Sega and the arcade landscape as a whole. Having been with Sega for less than a decade, he had already influenced hundreds if not thousands of other game designers that were entering into the field. He would go on to produce other notable games like Daytona USA and Virtua Cop, but around the time that Sega had introduced their home console to Sega Saturn, it started to become clear and evident that Suzuki's interests were starting to sway. Arcade game design has plenty of limitations, but one of the biggest ones is the use of a time limit. The gameplay of many of these titles was designed in such a way to increase the difficulty and eventually make the player lose. Once they've lost or the time limit was up, they'd have to put in another quarter to play again. This is the philosophy of what makes arcade games the way they are. To escape this, Suzuki started to explore the idea of creating an RPG with a large-scale narrative that wasn't bound by those game designs or the arcade time limit. With all that in mind, Suzuki and his team created a prototype for the Sega Saturn to test out all these new functions that they were trying to design. The prototype proved to the team that they were capable of utilizing the Sega Saturn hardware to achieve their goals. So in 1996, Suzuki and his team began building a 3D RPG using the Peach Tree game design as a prototype and the basis for all of their work. In the game's early design stages, initially the main character was supposed to be Akira, one of the fighters from Virtual Fighter, while also using the same fighting engine found in that game. While Suzuki and his team had proven time and time again how good they were at making a video game, when it came to actually telling a narrative story, that was a bit more difficult. Knowing this, Suzuki brought in a variety of playwrights, screenwriters, and movie directors to help flesh out the script and prevent it from solely focusing on the gameplay alone. Multiple aspects of the game would change throughout its development. Eventually, it wouldn't even be focused on any of the characters from Virtua Fighter at all. Instead, they would create an entirely original new character named Ryo Hazuki, and he would be featured as the main protagonist in a game that would now be titled Shenmue. The vision for the game greatly expanded, and with it, so did its budget. Lots of work and time had gone into the creation of the Sega Saturn version of the game, but unfortunately, this would never be released. Instead, the game would be moved over to Sega's next generation video game platform known as the Dreamcast. But it didn't stop there. Shinmu was not designed as a single title game, but a sprawling epic that would go across multiple titles. This means that while the first game was being developed and created, its sequels were also being made at the same time. This bold and ambitious take on game design would expand the game development's cost to be the most expensive game ever produced at its time. Upon its release in Japan in 1999 and the following year in the rest of the world, the game was critically acclaimed. But that acclaim would be short-lived. 
Sega had been struggling with console development, having seen problems with the Sega CD, the 32X, and the Sega Saturn. And when it came to the Dreamcast, the ride was unfortunately over. The Dreamcast was discontinued on March 31st, 2001. While Shenmue 1 was released worldwide on the Dreamcast, Shenmue 2, on the Dreamcast at least, only came out in Japan and Europe. A year later, Shenmue 2 would be released in North America. This time, though, it would be on the Xbox. And for many gamers out there that had played it on the original Dreamcast, certain game features were lost, having moved to a new system. And as it was a sequel, in order to prevent people from being lost in the story, they included a movie of the first game on a separate disc. This version of the game failed to gain traction. And after so many years of issues in development and unfortunate circumstances, Shenmue 3 seemed to be halted forever. But then, over a decade later, at the 2015 Electronic Entertainment Expo, this happened. A surprise announcement from Yu Suzuki announcing that he was launching a campaign to finish Shenmue 3 by crowdfunding. Hitting its initial target goal of $2 million in under 8 hours, it was quite apparent that there were still a lot of people out there that still liked Shenmue. With the recent hype and interest in Shenmue, Sega decided to take Shenmue 1 and 2 and remaster them in high definition. This remaster would be playable on Windows, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One, and for the very first time in North America, take both games and put them together on a single platform to play as one cohesive experience. But what is it that made people fall in love with Shenmue 1 and 2? Why would they spend millions of dollars of their own money to help fund a part 3? Is this HD collection of the first two games good enough to answer those questions? Well, let's find out. The original release of Shenmue on the Dreamcast is considered by many to be one of the premier games that was ever released on the platform. Not only were its graphics impressive for the time, but it also made use of several uncommon features that were not typical for the time period. One such feature was having every single line of dialogue performed and recorded by a voice actor. Another was designing unique assets from multiple character models, the idea being that if you walked down the street you wouldn't see the same character twice. The game would also feature plenty of things to do that typically may not have actually been needed to complete the main story. These features and many more made the original release of Shenmue 1 and Shenmue 2 on the Dreamcast utilize multiple discs. As time has moved on, we've seen the release of more powerful and capable video game systems, but we've also seen the introduction of new television technology that has unfortunately made older video games look a little bit worse for wear. This would lead to some gamers playing Shenmue for the very first time on a television that was never intended for the experience. But now, with Sega enlisting the help of developer D3T, we finally have a version that looks great on our modern televisions. This is Shenmue 1 and 2 HD. The plot of the game begins with Ryo Hazuki, a young teenager from Japan who's immediately thrust into a tragic situation. Somebody has forced their way into his home. Upon finding his family members beaten and abused, he quickly rushes to his family dojo to find his father confronting their attacker. The man known as Lan Di is demanding the location of some kind of mirror. They fight, and Ryo's father is quickly overpowered. Ryo attempts to intervene, but is unskilled enough to defend his father. Ryo's father refuses to let Lan Di know where the mirror is, but upon that moment, Landi threatens Ryo's life. Acting as any father would, he reveals the location of the mirror. While Landi's henchmen leave to retrieve the mirror, he reveals to Ryo's father a name of a man that Ryo's father had killed years prior. He invites him to die like a warrior, and then Landi lays upon him a devastating killer blow. His henchmen return into the dojo having found the mirror. Upon being satisfied of finding what he was looking for, he leaves. Ryo rushes to his father's side and holds him as he passes away. These are just the opening minutes of the game. You're already thrust into a situation of finding out who all these people are. Who is Lan Di? What is that mirror? Who did his father kill in the past? And why did he have to die? All these questions need answers, and Ryo is set out to find them. 
Shenmue 1 takes place entirely in Japan and begins in the city of Yokosuka. This location and many of its residents, including many of the owners of the shops in Dubuita, know who Ryo is and already have a built relationship with him. But as the mystery continues to unfold into Shenmue 2, Ryo will find himself in China, visiting Hong Kong, Kowloon City, and even Guilin. Ryo's adventures begin in 1986 and continue on into 1987, but the time of which elements take place in the game will always be different for every gamer because this game utilizes an active weather and time system that can change based upon the time that you play it. Though the relative story structure stays the same, certain elements of the game may change drastically, like snow on the streets, maybe it's raining, some characters in the game may reference the weather and other days they might not. This is the way that the game is made to feel so unique and original for everyone playing. But the one thing that won't change is the core story of Ryo trying to avenge his father's death. The location of Shenmue 1 is definitely smaller compared to all the locations of Shenmue 2, but the characters in Shenmue 1 seem to be more alive. They have jobs, they have lives, they go around doing things like partying at night or going to restaurants. You can see this actively happen as you pay attention to them walking around in the game. There is absolutely no reason to speak to some of the characters that you'll find in this game, but if you want to, you can, and when you speak to them, their narrative and their stories add to the texture of the overall experience. When Ryo leaves Japan for China entering into the events of Shenmue 2, he's surrounded by a world he doesn't know and by people he's never met before. Many of the elements of exploration and conversation from the first game follow with this one, but they're a little bit less pronounced with every individual character. Now there are primary characters, larger ones that assist you in your adventures moving forward, and those characters have a far bigger impact and their narratives are far more drawn out. But both Shenmue 1 and 2 aren't just about the characters and story, it's also about the places that Ryu visits, and the best way to represent that is through visuals. The HD remaster takes from two different sources. Shenmue 1 is taken from the original Dreamcast release, and Shenmue 2 is taken from the Xbox port. In both cases, they use the original textures and model work found in both games, but they've improved things like graphic overlays and text. Those original models, though, look even better in high resolutions, and things like the amazing model work done with the hands look even better now than they did in the past. Every location in both games is packed with rich visuals and details. There's so much to look at and take in, and whenever you go to explore this game, you're going to be seeing things that you're probably going to miss the first time that you'll catch around your second run. This release presents the majority of the game in a widescreen aspect ratio. However, there are elements that were originally presented in 4x3, like cutscenes, that have retained that format. At any moment, you can enter into the options and revert the game back to its original 4x3 aspect ratio for the entirety of its gameplay experience. You can also drop down the resolution and also turn off some other features to make the game look pretty close to what the original Dreamcast release was like. There's some added visual enhancements as well, but the game is still locked at the original 30 frames per second. This is simply because the original code of the game can't be altered that much, and they couldn't really change it for the HD release. On a positive note though, even though it is just limited to 30 frames per second, it's a consistent locked 30 frames per second. This means that it doesn't actually dip below, which was very common to see in the Dreamcast original. Regardless of how you choose to set the game up, it will always look visually more impressive than its original releases. Another very important aspect of Shenmue was the use of sound. As I already mentioned, every single piece of dialogue in this game has voiceover for it. But it's not only that. With this new release, they've also included the Japanese voiceover alongside the English, and you can choose to play whichever one you want. In both instances, you'll be hearing the original voice acting performances from both games. One aspect of this, though, is that the original voice acting performance quality is retained, which means that while some of it does sound okay, there are a couple of instances where the compression artifacts can be pretty noticeable. But due to the insane amount of voiceover that can be found in this game, it really doesn't bother me that much. Multiple music sequences in this game are synthesized or created electronically, but there are very key pivotal moments in the game that utilize full orchestral suites. These pieces of music are incredibly well composed. They add an additional layer of drama and emotion to every single scene that they accompany. Combined, these scenes create a cinematic quality that was very uncommon for its time. Every location in Shamu is matched with a 
wonderful sound design that makes every place feel authentic and real. In the courtyard of Ryo's home, you will hear the notable sound of a shishi odoshi, which is essentially a little bamboo device that's meant to scare away animals. In the restaurants, you'll hear familiar sounds of pots and pans while chefs prepare meals for their patrons. The streets of Dubuita will sound alive with the movement of vehicles going across the streets and people going about their days, the memorable chime of the local convenience store attracting people to come inside. And as the adventure continues into Hong Kong, the sound of the ocean lapping up against the coastline of Aberdeen. Needless to say, both games make great use of sounds, making these locations feel very real. But both sounds and visuals can only do so much. When it comes to a world this detailed, it has to be interactive. And that's where the philosophy of free comes into play. Many people refer to Shenmue as an RPG. However, that's not quite accurate. It's not even an open world RPG or what we would typically call a sandbox game. The game genre is known as free, which is an abbreviation for full reactive eyes entertainment. The premise of this genre was that anyone that played the game should be able to do whatever they wanted. If they were walking down the street and saw something, they should be able to look at it a lot closer. If they picked up some kind of object, they should be able to move it around and explore it. If they saw somebody on the street, they should should be able to go up to them and talk to them and have a unique piece of dialogue happen. If they went into an arcade and saw a video game, they should be able to play that arcade game. Those examples might be more obvious, but there's also smaller details in the game world, like going up to a vending machine, buying a drink and drinking it, and having that have absolutely no impact on the game. It doesn't give you extra health, you don't get a stat boost, nothing. You can also go to the convenience store and buy items that have no impact on the game, like potato chips or chocolate, and although you can't consume them, they do remain in your inventory throughout the first game itself. While it is true that by buying some of these objects you'll be rewarded with collectible toys, but that's not always the case for every object in the game. These collectible items encourage the player to explore everything. By going through every drawer of every desk and every dresser that you find, not only will you see a unique interior for every single dresser, but you'll also find objects that can help you with your adventure. In one specific portion of the game, you'll find yourself in a dark room. While in that room, you might be able to illuminate it with a light bulb, or maybe light a candle, or at the same time, if you were lucky enough, you found a flashlight that you can use to illuminate the room as well. But this one exact room perfectly illustrates what Shenmue is trying to achieve, because two of the items used to light up this room may never be used again, and what's very interesting is the fact that some players may have avoided these items altogether, not knowing that they could be used down here. But there are items in this room that if you do not find, they will not carry on with you to the next game. This was a revolutionary concept for its time. The idea that if you played the game into completion, you would get a completed game save. That game save could be moved over into the sequel game. That means that any item you would have collected would move forward with you. This was a feature that was lost on many North American gamers, as the first game was released on Dreamcast while the second one was released on Xbox. There was no way to take the game save from the first game onto the second. But now with the Shenmue 1 and 2 HD collection, that feature is completely intact. While the collectible items were fun, what was more important though was Ryo's moveset, because he learned martial arts moves from one game and brought them over to the next one. The story of Shamu begins with a martial arts battle, and the idea of martial arts continues as a primary focus between the first and second games. The combat system is obviously inspired by Virtua Fighter and feels very similar. In the first game, Ryo will learn moves from people that he meets and also by collecting martial arts scrolls. These techniques can be mastered over time by practicing them in multiple locations found in the game world. While Shenmue 1 has plenty of battles, there's simply not as many as what you will find in Shenmue 2, and I believe because of that, they chose not to continue the practice mode in its sequel. Based completely upon my own impressions, I feel that the fighting that takes place in Shenmue 1 is a little bit more rigid, where Shenmue 2's fighting engine feels a little bit more fluid and responsive. Perhaps though, that's just Ryo becoming a better fighter throughout his journey, but who's really to say? The battle system though isn't the only way that fights can be interactive. Shenmue makes use of Q QTEs, an abbreviation for quick time events. Sometimes through cutscenes, sometimes just randomly, button prompts will appear on the screen that you have to push instantly as fast as you can. The system is used in multiple situations and not just limited to fights. Throughout every single cutscene in the game, you need to be paying attention because at any moment a QTE could pop up and you need to be prepared for it. Shenmue 1 and 2 make use of a time system that's much faster than in the real world. There are points in the game that are time sensitive and require you to be at a certain place at a specific time. You might find yourself waiting an entire day just to wait for something to happen, so you have plenty of options to go around and do other things in the game world. 
This is something that's more prevalent in Shenmue 1. In Shenmue 2, they introduced a wait option that sped up the time for an event so that you didn't have to wait around all day. But you might find that it's better to utilize that free time. In Shenmue 2, most notably, you need to get jobs and earn money so that you can continue your adventure. In Shenmue 1, you eventually go through the main story and get a job working at the shipping yards, taking a forklift and driving it around and moving boxes from one location to another. Some of these jobs, like the forklifts, are time sensitive, and you have to complete them in a certain amount of time in order to get bonuses and to make more money. Some of these jobs may be hard and some of them may be boring, but they're essential onto completing the main quest of the story. Throughout the experience, you'll find multiple mini-games that you can interact with and play, but there's also variants on the basic gameplay that keeps you on your feet. It's easy to understand why so many gamers fell in love with the original releases of Shenmue 1 and Shenmue 2. There was just so much to do and so much to explore, and the narrative and story seemed on a scale unlike any other game that came before it. But I believe one of the biggest reasons why all these gamers helped fund Shenmue 3 was because Shenmue 2 ends essentially in a cliffhanger. Having a tale such as this remaining unfinished would have been a travesty. But for gamers out there that have never played Shenmue, should they go back and play the original releases, or should they play the new HD remakes, or should they just avoid them altogether? Well, let's explore that. The original releases, both on the Dreamcast and Xbox, have aged significantly. For their time, they were impressive examples of video game design and visual fidelity, but for many, the experience in no way felt complete. Outside of Japan, the game never quite followed through. The English voice acting was lost in Shenmue 2 on the Dreamcast in Europe, and when it finally arrived on the Xbox release, gamers were unable to continue their game saves from the previous console. But now, with the HD collection, the story and game elements of these first two entries in the Shenmue saga are finally combined. While I would personally recommend exploring the originals for what they are, newcomers will not miss out by beginning with this new remastered collection. And I also hesitate to call it remastered, as many of the assets are relatively unchanged. This really is a port of the original Dreamcast release for Shenmue 1 and the Xbox release for Shenmue 2, but what has changed is in my opinion, welcomed. The increased resolution and graphics tweaks make the original model work and textures in the game stand out, giving a whole new appreciation for the work that went into them originally. Loading times have been virtually obliterated. In the original, they could add untold seconds and sometimes minutes to the game that would slow the player's progress. In this release, loading times are barely noticeable, which alone would be enough for some gamers to play this over the original releases. The original tank-like controls are still intact. Now, some might find it troublesome, but I was able to complete both games easily. After a short few minutes of gameplay, everything kind of felt natural. Ryo's movements can be controlled with the D-pad, but they can also be controlled with the analog stick. This is something that we didn't actually have in the original Dreamcast release, and even though the controls still feel a little bit rigid, it's better than it was in the past. The original stock gameplay experience of Shenmue has largely remained the same. They have not added extra elements in the game world or introduced anything significantly to alter its original design. As as such, new gamers to the series may need to brace themselves. There are moments throughout the gameplay when Shenmue shows its age, having extended and sometimes confusingly long sequences that will test the player's patience. While the mechanics become more refined in the sequel, there are points in the game that will seemingly never end. Surprise QTE sequences might trip you up, fights may seem impossible, and at times, you'll likely feel completely lost. But all of this, like any good game, is temporary. The combination of all of these game elements that are challenging, frustrating, fun, and brilliant are what makes Shenmue a wonder to behold. Shenmue 1 and 2 Remastered is, in my opinion, not only the best way to play the series, but it surpasses all previous releases. And yes, that also includes the Dreamcast originals. But it also stands as an essential title for any dedicated gamer to take in. Just as Yu Suzuki's arcade games inspired game designers of the time, Shenmue influenced an industry and progressed gaming onto a whole new stage. However you choose to play it, whether it be on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, or PC, this is the version to own. The gamers who experienced Shenmue originally will be happy to return. For the players who are to start this journey for the very first time, prepare to be enticed by its brilliance. And for these reasons, and many, many more, Shenmue belongs in the Game Club. Oh